August 12, 2019 school board meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, Stacy, would you mind doing roll call? Lizzie Paff is not here. Not here. Gary Dunlap? Yep. Cheryl Hancock? Not here. Yes, she's excused. Uh, Tom Cruise? Here. Barb Wedstein? Here. Rebecca Reber? Here. Anita Shigazinski? She's excused. Thank you. Um, with four of the six board members present, I declare a quorum. I note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to this agenda? I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. I'll make a motion. Second. Um, Tom, Tom has moved and, hang on, sorry. Second. And Barb has seconded to approve the agenda as published. Any discussion? No, hearing none. All those in favor of the motion to approve the agenda as published, please by signify by saying yes. Aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying no. This motion has been approved. The motion to approve the published agenda has passed. I'm sorry, I'm not prepared. Um, Public participation. Is there anybody who wishes to address the board relative to anybody at this time? We have no public. I don't think no we public are. today. Sure we do. Good. Well, yeah, they're all public. Two of them live here. We got a couple. So <laughs> nobody has to come forward. Thank you. Thank you. On to reports and discussions. Dr. Mueller and Jill Mason on Academy on the Prairie programs. And this is information only, it's not on the consent agenda tonight. Yeah, correct. Yes. yes. Just click there. Well, we, we would introduce ourselves, but I think, well, Chris Mueller, I'm the <laughs> superintendent, district administrator, and Jill Mason, director of student services. Yeah, and so tonight we wanted to give an update and share some information about our Academy on the Prairie programs. So just to start, um, just some background information, most, most of you are aware, but just also for our public. So we do have um, one of our facilities called Oak Grove, and that is where our Academy on the Prairie programs are located. Um, and the Oak Grove facility is actually out in the town of Onalaska on Bryce Prairie. So in looking at our picture here, um, kind of blown up here, so this is 53 going up, and here's Midway. A lot of you know where Midway is over there off of 53. So there's a couple roads that can get you over onto Bryce Prairie here. Um, this is where OT cuts across from 53 also, and then here's 35, which goes up into onto Holman Drive. So our high school is actually located right up here at the intersection um, of McHugh and 53. Um, so as you can see, um, Bright, the academy is actually located out on this County Z out, can't see it here, out to here. And so it's about six miles from our current high school in that it takes uh, about 10 minutes to get there. Um, the one thing we run into troubles with is there is train tracks that actually go right along here, along this route, along the kind of XX here, train tracks. So many times when you're going to go onto Bryce Prairie, um, and those of you that live there know this, every once in a while you gotta stop and wait for the train. So sometimes it's 15, 20 minutes. Um, you just never kinda know, depending on the train schedule. So I'll let Jill kinda go into the uh, programs that are located out there. Sure, we have three programs right now. Project Bridge is our 18 to 20 year, one year old program. It's a transition program for our students who are um, in need of more independent skills. So we have Project Live, Project Search, and this is Project Bridge. And so we really do a lot of work out in the community and work with the other academy programs to help our students who have more significant needs learn how to function in their community and enjoy their time in their community. So um, Project Bridge does a lot with their card making company with Risk to Resilience Group, and that is the group that Carrie Grakowski runs. That is more for our students who have a lot of anxiety and um, trauma and need a smaller place to learn. 
So they do some face-to-face -face classes, some online learning, um, and they do a lot of um, portfolio work that is also attached to some WTC credits. Our Community Connections is run by Matt Pagliaro, and he does a lot out in the community as well, working at Clearwater Farms and taking the skills that he's teaching the students out into the community. Many of our students who attend Community Connections have um, the externalizing behavior, so um, really maybe showing some anger and frustration. So getting them out in the community and working with their hands um, seems to work better. So our philosophy for Academy on the Prairie is to provide a variety of educational options for students at risk of graduating or in need of a different learning environment. Our goal is to provide a welcoming atmosphere for students, provide a variety of resources to address AODA issues, mental health issues, and homelessness. We provide wraparound services with local agencies like Cooley Council on Addictions, Peace of Mind Counseling, La Crosse County, um, and many others. We um, are eager and, and would like to support um, family engagement, provide positive behavioral supports, alternative discipline options, timely school nursing options, and quality food and nutrition service options, and timely and appropriate transition options. So just as a reminder, back in December of 2017, in that the so this is our un and underfunded needs list and we this is part of our budget development cycle each year and so back in December 2017 we were this was our list that we developed for the 1819 budget year okay so that was this past year actually and the Academy on the Prairie learning space was ranked number seven as a need um, since then we've taken care of quite a few of these needs on the list in that and I'll be presenting on that coming up so then in December of 2018 came back with the needs list for this upcoming budget year and what we found is the Academy on the Prairie learning space actually moved to the rank of number two um, reason being is and I'll, I'll be presenting the details of um, all the different un and underfunded needs that had been met this past year and ones actually even for the upcoming budget year I'm um, just through a lot of different options and funding sources that we were resourceful with repurposing <coughs> or referendum dollars and so on. So just a reminder as to why we're bringing back the topic of the Academy. This is one of the reasons we're bringing back the topic of the Academy on the Prairie programs and learning spaces. It is still on the un and underfunded needs list. Then here is our district dashboard. Um, this is how we make our data-driven decisions. Um, it's a way for us to monitor, monitor our overall organizational health. Um, and if you notice on this dashboard, we have highlighted many green areas. And the reason those are highlighted is it's been determined that the, the reason it ranks so high on our needs list is by looking at alternative options for our Academy on the Prairie programs, it would actually affect all of those areas in green on our dashboard so the more that a need affects our dashboard and the over that which would affect then the overall organizational health of our district um, so that's so we'll go into some details of that so the first one there under student learning um, we have one thing that our community said was really important to them is student character and developing character um, and we believe by having um, with the programs right now out on the academy on out in the town of Onalaska on Bryce Prairie, um, the character students by providing more services for them that are lo locally um, located within the village of Homan and in this area, we would be able to provide more locally um, programs such as the nursing, the counseling would be much more readily available, um, and even administration because right now Nick Bakke is our administrator for the Academy of Prairie he has to drive out there every time they need something um, they don't have a nurse on site they don't have a counselor on site so those services um, that the students need especially for their mental health and well-being are not necessarily out there and they have to travel a lot for that mm -hmm. is there anything you wanted to add on student learning nope. okay then under the fiscal pillar we had um, the transportation per pupil cost and then just our nutrition services um, 
Students currently are transported multiple times daily from the building to the high school because actually they take some courses at the high school and then they take some courses out on um, at the Oak Grove building. So they not only might take a bus out there in the morning from the high school, but then they are transported by van back and forth many times, depending on because of the schedule and how that is. Um, and then also just as far as their um, in talking with uh, Mike Gasper, he said that they prep lunches daily for those students and then bring them, well, the staff has to prep them, but then the transportation department has to bring out the breakfast and then bring out the lunch later and so on just for the student group in that. Is there anything you want to add on that? No, what we've tried to do with transportation is um, in the past, when students were placed at Academy on the Prairie, they were, they were placed there most of the time for the entirety of the day. What we've done in the past um, three years is really talk about a blended learning option. So if they want to take um, a CTE course at the high school or a family and consumer sciences course, they're able to take that course and also do their learning out on the prairie. They can have a blended option because sometimes they need both of those things. So we're really trying to do that. The, the difficult thing is the distance and the lack of support. So um, if you're wondering why we would opt for driving them back and forth, it's because we're trying to give them the best possible scenario <coughs> for their diploma and for their learning um, at, at both places. And then we did actually, um, back in 2017, did a cost analysis on the Oak Grove building at that time. And, and basically what we were, one thing we were looking at is that we, like if we were to, still use the building maybe for storage because that was one of the needs we had we just did not have enough storage space in the district but not use it as a learning environment what how much money would we save on maintenance cost and we had figured it'd be about thirty eight thousand dollars annually that we could save um, on the maintenance of the building just because of the different type of upkeep you would need for storage versus actually living and breathing <coughs> that, that facility so and then um, under workforce, just our staff satisfaction and retention. Um, our staff are really isolated out there and have limited resources um, in that. And they don't necessarily have timely access to other <coughs> staff. Oh, I don't know if there's anything else to add. Um, and that was discovered when um, Jill had done the study and went out and asked questions and did some focus groups with the staff out there. And Mr. Sackett too. When I first started three years ago, Mr. Sackett and I, that was one of the first things we started doing is doing a study. So we did a lot with the staff, asking them their wish list and, and then a needs list and really talking to them about different learning opportunities. And then when Kim came on board, we were able to talk through even more instructional practices and um, learning options that were project-based and alternative learning. So we really feel like we're on path for an alternative learning option, not just a different location. So which kind of goes into the customer satisfaction. Um, so the students at the Academy on the Prairie don't necessarily have the same food choices um, as the students that are at our other locations just because of they're not having an actual kitchen and food facility right in their building. So they're more of a bag lunch style options. There's a kitchen there, isn't there? Well, there is, but we would have to staff a sure. kitchen to deal. So they, what they do right now, my understanding is they make the lunches at the high school mm -hmm. and then they um, transport them, those over um, to the building in that. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as course, you know, like Jill was talking, they do a lot of blended learning in courses. Um, with the travel time and distance, it makes it difficult sometimes for them to take certain courses and fit it into the schedule at the high school. And that just, because by the time they're doing some of their coursework out there, then they have to get in and drive. And just um, on the block schedule and the skinnies and blocks and so on, it's just hard to fit some of the options that the students would really like into their um, schedules with that um, and just with that location. And then um, health and safety. Um, this is one that I learned about very quickly and it just really surprised me and I don't know if a lot of people really realize this, but with it being in the town of Onalaska, our Village of Home Police Department, are, that is not in their jurisdiction. So when something is needed out at the academy, it is um, the sheriff, the county sheriff is called because um, that's who the town of Onalaska works with. 
So for law enforcement, um, we work, we have a SRO through the village of Holman, which is Joe Hickey. Well, when there's something that happens out there, sometimes the county will respond, and Joe Hickey doesn't necessarily, um, he is not involved with it then, which that connection is broken in services um, in how we would wrap around at times. Our home and police department and our home and fire department are also um, very involved in our safety planning and it's very difficult when we can't have con we can have conversations with them but they are not directly involved with the prairie programs because that's not their jurisdiction so it just becomes a little bit disjointed All right any questions on any of that that we were just talking about it seems to me like um, one of the reasons we took them down the prairie because there was a need for to get the student either have the student segregated from the general population or have the general population segregated from the student and if if what you're proposing as I can see down the road that you're proposing comes along then that's going to be taken away is that is that a concern so I you bring up a good point and it's very true one of the reasons is that they needed to be in a different learning environment away from maybe large amounts of their peers um, what we're finding is we still want to maintain that because when we did the high school facility study this last year when we were going to referendum we studied if we should bring those students back and should we be building learning space at the high school forum and it was determined no no we shouldn't because of exactly what you said mm -hmm. in that so but then what we're running into trouble with is the services that these students need that they're located where they are, their availability and the timing and efficiencies for them to get the services is challenging. So you'll see here what we're trying, what some options we'd like to explore to make both of those things occur for the students to get the best services and, and meet the, each of their individual needs. There are benefits, and mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, so I, I was just gonna say the next slide. So we do have current benefits, you're absolutely right. The small group atmosphere has been, it, it has really served its purpose. And I would say, and, and Mr. Sackett, you could probably concur, our staff down there really like their space. Um, maybe not it, it, the building so much, but their, their space is nice. They love having it away from the general population because a lot of our students do have anxiety about the large group area and may have had some maybe rough learning experiences up there. So they do enjoy that. We have had success um, and in, in that smaller setting. And there is a great amount of space out there. So we did use that building to its purpose. There was a reason that, that we use that building because we have it. Um, so it has served its purpose very well. We do have a lot of different options out there for students. It's just um, at this point when you look at the overall learning and well-being of the students, it's, we could have a better option to meet their needs. So what we'd like to recommend is to explore options located closer in the area of home in here, because um, that could bring about efficiencies for our transportation and for our nutrition services. Also improve the proximity of the services that these students are in more need of. Um, and a lot of it even has to do around transition for the students, them being able to even walk and do some maybe um, part-time work or the mm -hmm. school to work program more. Because um, with them being out on the prairie, it gets more challenging um, with the transportation. And um, they don't all, not all of them are able to drive or able to have parents to drive them places either. And we always don't have transportation available as frequently as we'd like. Um, and we would also, um, we could, which means we could increase our partnership opportunities if we were in a location more centrally located in, in, the, in the Holman area. One thing that came out when Mr. Second and I did our study is they really want to be together. So we have Project Bridge out there right now, and that's our students who have um, pretty significant needs. And then our Risk to Resilience program, and they do their card company together. So they work together to produce the cards that we sell. Um, I think Lynn Wilson comes here every year to talk about it. And they said they really want to stay together. That partnership um, is really key. And, and we all went down for their graduation this spring. And a lot of them wrote about that partnership in their portfolios. So there were a couple of big things, you know, they really want that, that partnership to continue. And then another key area was our students on the prairie, it's really hard for them to get jobs. 
in a different half of the day because of the transportation issues. So um, before, it, it was actually two, two or three years ago when we started talking to them, they said it'd be really great if we could be in the village of Holman so our students, if they wanted to walk to work or um, if they needed a cab ride, it, it might be easier to do in the village of Holman than out where they are. So as far as next steps, um, we're gonna be coming back to the next board meeting to present to you again in that we'd like to, and what we would like to do is present some potential location options, um, explore other collaborations and partnerships. Um, I mean, it's no unknown that there has been um, an opportunity that of this Boys and Girls Club location that has come about in our community, which kind of prompted us to say, you know, we've been studying this, we know what our needs are, it's been around for a while, and an opportunity has come up. We need to really explore, we'd like to explore that option and see, well, what are all the partnerships? What would be the cost analysis of doing something like that? Would it be the right thing to do for these, for these students in the district? So um, with that, if you guys are seeing the need like us, we would like to present at our next board meeting them with some of those. Yes. Yeah, I just got a couple questions. Um, Definitely. <clears throat> probably, probably a fairly, I mean, Gary brought up something really interesting. That's the same thing. I used to teach alternative schools, so I have a real, I would love for those, those that gang. But, uh, and I can infer what you meant by train tracks, but do you have anything specific to add to why, you mentioned the train tracks right away when you started talking. What specifically, is it just the delays waiting for the train all the time or? Well, if you have a call, so you have a student in crisis out there and you call for help, you don't know how long it's gonna be sometimes when they're gonna to arrive to help. And with limited resources and staff out there, just safety wise, you know, you, I'd rather ha prevent something And not have a train blocking you to get there, right? To get there, yeah. Okay. Um, I understand that kids aren't running the show, but did you, have you interviewed any of the kids, any of the children about this? Or any thoughts on they, what they say about it? Yeah, so when Mr. Sackett and I first talked to them, the staff down there, they also talked to the students. Um, and they also like their space away from the high school. Um, and they, I think, really enjoy, depending on who you talk to, the mm -hmm. opportunity to be able to at least take a class or two or whatever they're interested in at the high school level that they can't get at the prairie. But they want that, the, the services at the prairie too because that is really where they're thriving. So they want, the, and they also, many, like I said before, many of them really want to be with the students in Project Bridge. That is a very impactful and powerful collaboration. Um, and they're also missing, I think, you know, many of them miss seeing their counselors. Their counselors aren't able to be out there very much um, due to the distance and time factor. And then, um, you know, just some of the other resources that they might have at the high school or in the local area. Yeah, I, I understand the semantics and the scheduling and the point A to point B issues. Um, that I bike out there all the time. It's very relaxing out there. It, it's, there's, you can't compare that to the festival building at all, in my opinion, as far as the same environment. But I understand you got your struggles and you're, you're going to do what you can. So. And I think if you're talking about like the ride and the location as far as scenery, I don't think they would argue that that point <laughs> yeah. either I think when you walk into the learning space and the and the distance between the two and the services provided that's where mm -hmm. we get into trouble they have bikes they've been really fortunate to be able to ride their bikes out there and do those things and I still see them doing those options using those options but as far as a learning space it has um, come to the point where we need to look elsewhere <laughs> well and the money you'd save with storage as opposed to mm -hmm you know HVAC and all that so is it in decent shape the building oh uh, there's some needs with it um, we're working through that with John in that um, just you know depending on to what extent do you need to repair a roof or to what extent do you need to replace you know certain type parts of the building um, you probably know that better Tom than I do at this point in time <laughs> when you do your home inspections like you know it's a lot different living in a space than having a storage um, shed of some sort and I don't know there could maybe be other options for the Oak Grove building too so yeah. thanks does the district own that property or yes we don't have a mortgage out on it anymore nope we do we do own the Oak Grove facility and some of the surrounding land around that area yeah. 
And then how many students are served down there? Anywhere, I would say between 15 and 20. Okay. Could be more. I mean, I, it's hard to tell they come and go, so. They come think, in and out of the you program. Think about, about that, maybe That's, a little more? It's about that. And we do our best to sort of bring, sometimes transition them back to the high school. Yes. That's their goal for some too, so mm -hmm. roughly. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. And Jill Mason. I'll sit here for a while. There you go. <laughs> Educational <laughs> Assistant, Special Education. Um, this will be on the August 26th consent agenda. Okay. All right. So we had a new student come into the district um, who requires an individual educational assistant per his IEP. And so we need to come to the board and um, ask for an increase of 1.0 FTE educational assistant at the high school to make sure we are fulfilling his needs. So that is what this is, I believe this is on for consent next Next board meeting, 26. Yes. Yep. Any questions about that one? Yeah. Just, yeah. I know districts do things very differently, so I'm assuming you guys have accepted the IEP and assume, you know, and are concurring yes. that that's a need. Yes, and I've spoken to the family too. Okay, good. Yes, there's multiple. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and I I should also say that anytime. We have students that come in. We make sure to look at schedules. We make sure to talk about, okay, what do we have going in the building? Are we able to fulfill these needs within what we already have? So we exhaust everything that we already have, both in the building and throughout the district. And we've already done that because the last time we were here, I was talking about additional EAs already last time. And so we've already exhausted, I've already met with you know, Melissa and HR, and we've already talked about all those. And we got to this point, there wasn't a whole lot of other options until we do our study on um, kind of roles and responsibilities. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, maybe you can't tell me this, and I can totally understand. Is it, what kind of needs? Is it safety needs? Is the child violent or something? Or um, I would say safety and daily living skills. So he gets angry or whatever. Or? Um, I can't go into details on that, uh, but I would say daily living skills from the sense of. Um, um, eating, toileting, kind of those global. I understand. Global, Thank you. global types of needs. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thanks, Jill. You're welcome. Um, next is Jill. Yeah, she's <laughs> the Jill show <laughs> tonight. Agreements for project search began on the August 26th consent agenda. Okay, so project search. As you know, Project Search is our 18 to 21 year old transition program that we house at Gunderson Health System. And every year we come to you with our 660301 agreements with the other school districts. And this year we are fortunate to have many agreements. We have um, Galesville, Ettrick, and Trempolo, School District of Onalaska, School District of La Crosse, School District of West Salem, and School District of Prairie du Chien. So all of those districts are participating in our Project Search program so we're very excited about that um, and then so every year then we talk to you and tell you that we're going to do these agreements with the other districts and we charge them um, basically the open enrollment cost which is approximately seven thousand where is that seven thousand seven hundred seventy one dollars and then at the end of the year typically at the end of the year is when the other districts, we invoice the districts and they pay us that amount for having their students. So all of those districts have agreements with us. I'll show you an example of the agreement. So this just talks about what our responsibility is as the host district, we're considered the host district. And then um, goes into our contract just saying that we'll be the fiscal agent. We also have to report them for state reporting, so we have to be collaborative with the other district. Talking about categorical aid. And then both boards are required to sign that. And then it just says that we staff the classroom or we staff the program. 
And then any other decisions we have to bring to the administrators of the other district. So basically we have one of these agreements for each of the districts I mentioned before. Then we also have a estimated costs for each number of interns for each district. I think Prairie Duchene has three, West Salem two, um, on Alaska and La Crosse I believe have one. So we're full this year, 12. That's been the goal for Gunderson and we hit it this year. It's great. How long has this been in place? This is the third year. And just so that you know, we'll, we'll be coming back in October. Jen Slusser and Laura Anderson, the lead teacher, will be coming back in October. But we were asked, Project Search in, the, in Holman was asked to present at the National Conference this summer in California. Wow. So we'll be presenting in October. Jen and Laura and um, Laureen, one of the skills workers, were out in California this summer presenting for us as, again, they were asked to be out there. So kudos to you as a board for approving project search for us in Holman and um, kudos to them they've just done a fantastic job so it was a pretty exciting summer that was my goal yeah. I've worked with a couple of the, of the kids down at uh, Gunderson and, and they're hard workers and so is the I, I, you have to help me with the girl that comes down and checks on them. Lorene probably or Molly yeah and she's she's dynamite too but the kids were they were great they had a great sense of humor and they dug right in we we worked them hard when they were down there and and they learned some real skills and uh, Two of the last boys, one of them we hired back as a, in uh, environmental service down there. And, um, I believe all of them this year, I want to say, except for maybe one or two, have jobs, whether they're at Gunderson or <coughs> they're at other locations. So they do, Gunderson just does such a great job. The mentors, are, if you go have any time to go to the graduation oh, at yeah, the end of the year, event, yeah. it is fantastic. The mentors show up, people from Gunderson, I mean, huge people from Gunderson like CEOs are there it is amazing and the the level of skills that our our interns have received from their mentors in that program are just unbelievable had some students for the first time driving um, gators and driving mowers and mowing yards and doing all of these things it's and and the mentors actually tried to find one of our interns a job there but they didn't have an opening so they I think they put them in like a food service or something until they could open up the environmental science yeah. forms. So they really, really <clears throat> take hold. And, and one of the mentors actually brought his old antique car. He had a Model T. And he brought it to the graduation because he knew that the mentor he was working, or the, the intern he was working with loved old cars. So for the graduation, he <coughs> trailered his Model T car just to show his intern that he had with him. So it was <laughs> he and his dad I have pictures of it. They smiles ear to ear. They just thought that was the coolest thing. They went around and uh, invited us to, personally invited us all to go. They're really <laughs> excited. And uh, the one that you're talking about that's trying to get, we're trying to get a job for, uh, once a week or so, he comes in and gives me one of these, you know. <laughs> I just love having them around. They're just great kids. Great kids. Do these kids get jobs in other industries too? Some of them do. So we have a couple of, that, uh, couple of them that are out but they receive a lot of skills training and job training on the job training at Gunderson and with their mentors that are that can be used elsewhere. But many of them, I would say probably 75% of them, if not more, are at Gunderson. Mm -hmm. It's good to have Successful. that sort of foundation because the people say on average you work six different jobs in your lifetime. Not, not everybody, but that's not uncommon, so. No. Any questions about our 6603 agreements for project search? It's hard to convince them that uh, I asked them if they were with their Holman program, and they go, I'm in the Holman program, but I went to Central. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, can't break them of that. And really, we don't try. So after they're done, they graduate in, I think it's like May 29th, we return them back to their, their home district, and they are able to receive a, a graduate or a diploma from from their school, their home district. So. Thanks, Jill. Very proud. I think you're up next. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Agreement for physical therapists. Yes. So um, thank you to Julie for helping us figure this out and for Onalaska School, Kent from Onalaska School District and, and Lori. We were fortunate enough to have a 
our physical therapist agree to stay on with us as a 1.0. Um, we newly hired that position. If you, ha if you didn't remember, we are not doing our contract with Nancy Riddle anymore as she's going into retirement. So we hired the position in district in house. Um, and we needed the physical therapist for four days a week in Onalaska, who's been working with um, a physical therapist as well. They only needed the person for one day a week. And so we were able to come up with a 660301 agreement with Onalaska to um, share the costs of the physical therapist. So basically, this is written similarly to the one you just saw for Project Search, but we are um, doing this for a staff member to provide the services for students. And then I will show you the salary, the estimated salary and benefits for this. So this is how it's calculated. Again, thanks to Julie and her team in the business office for helping calculate the wages and benefits for this person and then sharing it with on Alaska so that they know. What kind of therapy do they do? They, so physical therapy is more um, gross motor. So maybe throwing a ball, catching, walking upstairs, um, stretching ligaments, biking. Um, we have bikes that go through the schools all the time. Oh gosh, I think we have four bikes at the high school right now um, for students. So really getting them able to, to move and have fitness um, for their on, for life, ongoing life activities. Occupational motor is more fine motor with hands and, and working at desks and writing those type of things. Is it speech therapy too? Nope. Speech is a whole different thing, but yeah, that's another service we provide. Mm -hmm. I know our son had some issues and playing the saxophone really helped him mm -hmm. with speech. So. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any questions about the physical therapist agreement? Jill. Yes. You don't have the next one? You I know. You I think do I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's like, here you go. Oh. <laughs> uh, student activity me. account. I forgot to Julie. tell me to wear my black dress today. Good evening. So every year in August, we present to the board the student activity accounts, which are accounts in our Fund 60. Um, student activity accounts are intended to be um, monies raised by the students and for the students, meaning they make the decisions in how the money is spent for their club. Um, the six student activities that we're presenting tonight are the same that I've presented the last couple years. They include arts, art club, student council, senior video committee, um, students against destructive decisions, Holman FFA, and Holman FFA greenhouse. Um, the staff advisors are identified, and I believe we're missing one student advisor yet for the art club. Um, so this is for the 1920 school year. Um, one thing I do want to say about student activity, um, GASB 84, which is Government Accounting Standards Board, statement number 84, um, is requiring that school districts treat these a little differently as of July 1st. So we are still waiting on guidance from DPI um, and from GASB 84 and exactly what that means. But up until now, the accounting for student activity um, has not gone through the same woofer coding system as all of our other funds. So when I present um, school district budgets, we have fund, function, object, we have all those um, codes that we use for all the other funds to identify revenue and expenditures. Um, the student activity accounts in Fund 60 have not had that requirement. Um, and going forward, or backwards, because it's as of July 1st, um, we are going to have to do that with these accounts which are considered fiduciary accounts. And so we're working to um, make some changes in how we process these and bring them into the business office. Um, the requirement is greater administrative oversight of these accounts. Um, so some changes there in case you hear any rumbling from the high school about that. Um, we're working um, with those advisors and um, Wayne and his administrative assistant, Jane, to uh, kind of bring that 
I'll say in-house with all of our other funds, um, but we still intend to have these six student activity uh, clubs or groups going forward. It just the accounting will be um, more specific and in line with the rest of our accounting. So any questions on these? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on to consent agenda items. Um, the board has been furnished with background materials on each item, or we've discussed it previously. These will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and will be voted on separately. Anybody want anything pulled? Okay. Now I might mess this up, so bear with me. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? As presented. So, Gary? Second. Gary has moved and Tom has seconded the motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Any discussion? Perfect. Okay, thanks. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the per consent agenda items, please signify by saying yes. Or aye. aye. Or aye. aye. Those okay. opposed, signify by saying no. Well, motion passes. Thank you. I just wanted to make one quick announcement. I just wanted to mention and thank Mary Lang, because I know she's watching tonight. <laughs> so, oh. no, she was an educational assistant at Prairie View, and um, she is retiring in that, and she's been with us since 2007. So thank you to Mary for all of her great service um, in the district to, to the kids. She'll be missed. So. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, now I'll call upon call upon board members in the order of the roll call and I would ask you to present any comments or committee reports you have. Um, Gary. What? <laughs> <laughs> Stress me out. We're going to have a uh, finance committee meeting finally. Uh, yeah, coming this up. This week and it's in August, the first one for a long, long time. And, uh, we're looking forward to that. We're going to talk about the audit, which is always a barrel of fun. Um, I just want to make one comment, and that was about the, what's been happening around the school district the last month or so with the, the school with the Scogans and the school additions, and it's just it's just overwhelming. And I think about in two years what this community is going to have for the kids, and you know. it's just going to be incredible. We're going to have we're going to have people moving in here by the bazillions. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be so awesome that uh, they just uh, uh, Scogans Gary Scogans just stunned me when he when he came up and said what he said. And, Mm -hmm. um, they've been so great, gracious and then the school district I went out there uh, today and checked on the dirt moving around and stuff mm -hmm. and it's getting to be it's a really big deal out there it's uh, moving along good so it's so exciting it's yeah it's gonna be amazing to see what it's like when it gets all done we have our bids coming in on Thursday so Ooh. we'll Hopefully be presenting at the next board meeting so yeah we're pretty so competitive we're right for. now I think yeah come in good. we have some interest so we're excited <laughs> to see <clears throat> Um, Tom? Yeah, I agree with Gary. I was driving around on Sunday looking at the new subdivisions and stuff. It's just incredible. <coughs> we got our work cut out for us as far as growth. I mean, I've, I know land and uh, people like that berry patch, they had listed for a million dollars. That was their selling price for the land. And I know they were, that was, I know that from realtors. It's just, let's see what happens. So. You notice out there that the TIF is doing a lot of activity out there too. There's something going on out there. And I'm looking forward to the Prairie um, review. I, yeah. I, I'm really concerned that it, they, they, they maintain some sort of, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's a nice area out there. I know it's mm -hmm. not. <coughs> the semantics and the location aren't favorable to the district, but mm -hmm. I know you'll do your best. So. Anything else, Tom? No. Fire? I was just excited um, by the quality candidates who came forward to replace Kate in her absence. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I'm excited that we'll have a new board member. Yeah. I agree with you. That's true. Yeah. That's good. And that will be next mm -hmm. next meeting then. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yep. Anything else, Barb? Nope. Um, my turn. I'm. I see that the roundabout's going kind of what good over there yeah. at the Sand Lake. It's really coming along. Is that anybody know if that one that's planned to be done? Um, I met with Scott actually this last week. I have a question and, too on that. Um, it's gotta be close. He <laughs> said, "Right, as school is starting, it should be all finished." <laughs> but I think be, the point up to where the school is 
will be finished, but it's just right past that, where that roundabout, where they have a little bit work that first week of September yet, is what I had heard. <coughs> you know, I don't, it, that's frustrating, a little bit of all that development, and I understand it's the way it goes, but when I went to Cooley Life Church for a while, and we talked to the board, and we, I negotiated a better price for the Cooley Life's sign, and they guaranteed me they could move that sign there and it'd be fine, and then they took it away. I mean, they, they changed the, I don't know, the, the road, how it went. They said, sorry, you, they don't have a sign there at all anymore. Oh. I thought that was kind of sad. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's how it goes. Yeah. Do you know if they're going to, the road on Sand Lake from all that development over to Holman, that's still an older road, are they going to tear that up too? I didn't know. Do you have any insight on that? Which road? The neighborhood, you mean? Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's where the new section stops and then it, the road's older. And, oh. and, and I don't know, I, I see don't, a bunch of markers on the sides of the road. I, I know. do not know that yeah. on that. On Maybe that Scott would know if you had talked to him. I do know there's a development coming um, where the Perch Farm was on the other side of the road there from Sand Lake in that open area. Wow. So, yeah. Jeez. Lots of developments. Yeah. But it'll be over year you know next five ten years where those will be going up so yeah I'll keep them all shut. thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have not had a building grounds meeting I assume that we'll have one soon I think on an underfunded yeah. needs to discuss yeah we that. were waiting for our new board member to come on yeah. board and now we'll get committee assignments and we'll be working with Cheryl to send out our you know dates and times and committees oh. structures and getting that all rolling here soon sounds good so we'll be back at it <laughs> Thank you. I don't have anything else. Does anybody else have anything? No. Um, the next board meeting is August 26th at 7 o'clock. And that's all I have. If there's any other business that needs to come before the board at this time? No. If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Barb. Anybody want to second that? I'll second it. Tom, thank you. Barb has moved and Tom has second to adjourn the meeting at 7.50 p.m. Wow. Motion right. carried. Good job. Thank you much. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for your audience.